the Samsung S21 Ultra. Samsung's flagship phone for 2021. I've had mine for about six weeks and I will have it for the next two years because yes, this is my phone. So did I buy the right handset? Is this the right phone for you? Let's have a closer look. While the S21 Ultra is definitely one of the most advanced Android phones on the market, the size of the leap really is going to depend on what you're coming from. In my case, I've upgraded from the Galaxy Note 10 Plus, which was one of the other no compromise top end flagship phones from Samsung about two years ago. Now, as you can see, there's a big difference in the design between these two phones. The most striking difference comes from the camera bump, which is absolutely enormous. And of course there are a couple more camera sensors compared to the Note 10. Other big differences include a huge change in thickness. This is a very chunky phone. It's definitely not in line with Samsung's thinner, lighter and more slimline design philosophy that started with the Galaxy S8. Another change from the 10 series phones is the lack of that distinctive double curve screen design. There are no more edge screens and this is a, a much flatter model than what we're used to. Of course, this was already true with the S20, but I personally really like this double curve that started with the S8. Despite being such a large phone, I don't really have any trouble reaching every spot on the screen using just my thumb, but there are software solutions built into these Samsung phones to make it easier to do everything one-handed. Despite having such a humongous camera bump, it's still a big improvement over the S20 in my opinion. I found the bump on that phone to be unacceptable. Samsung have managed here to integrate the bump into the body nicely, and I do love the two-tone color treatment they've given it in this new design. If I'm being honest, Overall, I still prefer the size, shape, and ergonomics of the Note 10 Plus. But there's nothing exceptionally wrong about the S21's ergonomics. It's just a bigger and bulkier phone in comparison. Seen by itself, it's just fine and very comfortable to use. The next most important thing I have to talk about is the screen. The screen is the most important component for a smartphone. When you think about it, that's what you spend most of your time interacting with. It's not only what your eyes see, but what it feels like to use. In this respect, the S21 Ultra probably offers the largest upgrade over the previous generation of Samsung phones. While phones like the Note 10 Plus only had a 60Hz OLED panel, the S21 Ultra has a 120Hz panel, just like the S20, but a big difference here is that you don't have to choose between resolution or refresh rate. The S21 Ultra lets you run at the full 1440p resolution while also using the 120Hz adaptive mode. Of course, in the iron triangle between refresh rate, resolution and battery, you will be sacrificing some battery for this. We'll talk about that in just a second. The OLED panel in the S21 Ultra is one of the best that Samsung has ever made, and it produces the same deep, vibrant picture that we've come to expect from this top-end screen manufacturer. The 120Hz adaptive refresh rate is a joy to use and makes a massive difference to simply interacting with the operating system or browsing web pages. While you can't see it in a 24, a 30 or a 60 frame per second YouTube video, there really is a massive difference in the smoothness using a 120Hz panel versus a 60Hz panel. It's one of the biggest quality of life upgrades that smartphones have had recently. It changes the way the phone feels to work with. And even if another phone has similar specs to something like the S21 Ultra, the faster panel will always feel more responsive and feel snappier. This screen is very bright, rated for 1500 nits. And of course it is HDR10 certified, which means if you use an app like Netflix and you're watching HDR content, then you're in for a very good time. It's a fantastic movie watching experience. Speaking of which, the built-in stereo speaker array is just fine and there is no headphone jack, but in the end, the best experience will always be with headphones. However, visually, it's really not that much of an upgrade over the S10 Plus or even the S20. I doubt most people would be able to tell the difference just looking at it, other than the fact that it is a crispy image than the S20 running at 120 Hertz. So let's talk about performance for a second. The first thing that I have to say about the S21 Ultra is that performance just doesn't matter. This is a phone at the very high end of the Android stack at this point, and really, for 99% of users, performance is never going to be an issue. Now, there are spec differences depending on which phone you end up buying. Samsung sells two main variants of their flagship phone. This is something that's not new, but it's something you have to be aware of. 
If you live in the United States or in China, you'll get the Snapdragon 888 SoC in your phone, which is of course at the moment the fastest chip they make. If you live anywhere else in the world, you'll get the international version of the Galaxy Ultra. That means you're getting Samsung's in-house Exynos processor. Now in the past, this has been a bit of a big deal. With the Note 10 Plus, for example, it was significantly slower and worse in many ways than the Snapdragon version of the same phone. With the S21 Ultra, well, the benchmarks show that there really isn't a definitive version of the phone that's better than the other. There may be differences on a per game or per app basis depending on the specific job, but by and large they perform very similarly. One place where there is a difference is in battery life, although in practice that hasn't really shown up as an issue using the Exynos phone, which is supposed to be weaker in terms of battery life than the Snapdragon phone. In day-to-day -day use, as you'd expect, the S21 Ultra is an absolute monster. Apps load instantly, things happen with the snap of a finger, apps that do heavy lifting with music production or with video editing all work perfectly. Well, as perfectly as individual apps can. Of course, things like crashes still happen, but that's got nothing to do specifically with the S21 Ultra. The real place where performance gets pushed is of course in video games. Now, you can buy dedicated gaming phones, although these usually come with big compromises in terms of screen quality or in terms of design. The S21 Ultra is not designed to be a gaming phone, but you'll find that it will run just about anything out there as well as any other phone, barring some thermal throttling issues that can happen if you play for a long time, but that's normal for any non-gaming phone without an active cooling system. It's not just that Samsung sells two different versions of its phone with two different CPUs. You'll also get different amounts of RAM depending on what capacity phone you buy. If you buy a 512 gigabyte model or higher, you'll get 16 gigabytes of RAM. Buy anything under that and you're only getting 12 gigabytes of RAM. Now, I say only, but honestly, 12 gigabytes of RAM is more than enough for almost every user. It's very unlikely that you'll notice any difference between these two RAM allocations. I'm going to put the spec sheets up on the screen for those of you who are interested, but really, most people who are going to buy this phone will be perfectly happy with the performance. There really is nowhere to go from here other than perhaps moving over to Apple, which has a big silicon advantage at this point. And now we come to the real stars of the show. The four cameras you'll find on the back of the S21 Ultra. You'll find a 108 megapixel wide angle main shooter, a 10 megapixel periscope telephoto camera, another 10 megapixel telephoto camera, and a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera. One of the reasons that I did not want to upgrade to the S20 Ultra that came before this was because of reports of notorious autofocus issues that that phone had. Even today, despite multiple software fixes by Samsung, it still doesn't seem to be right for some users. One thing I can say about the S21 Ultra's cameras is that they have performed flawlessly to me. The S21 Ultra is capable of creating images the way that I envision them which is a big step up over what smartphones have done in the past, where the photos always come out a little worse than you expect them to. Now, some of this might be due to computational photography, but a lot has to do with the quality of the glass and the sensors in the phone as well. As you can see, I've had a lot of fun taking photos over the last six weeks, and many of them have come out great. Just a little bit of color work, a little bit of cropping, and they're ready to post or even print. One particularly fun thing I like to do is to use the focus enhancer mode of the phone. Once the phone detects that you are closer than a certain distance, it will switch over to a macro mode. And you take fantastic pictures of very small things such as models or insects, or even the fine textures of something. Every one of the cameras that comes with this phone have a practical use. I didn't think I'd be switching between them that much, but I often found myself taking at least one photo with each camera to get the advantage of different framings, detail levels, and styles. Night mode's pretty impressive as well, but nowhere near as good as the DSLR left on long exposure. When it comes to video, the quality is more than acceptable. There are various different choices in terms of resolution or frame rate, but you can go all the way up to 8K at 24 frames a second. How useful 24 FPS 8K footage really is, is debatable, but it's pretty cool to go all the way there if you need to. The other camera we absolutely must not forget about is the front-facing selfie camera. This is, without a doubt, the best selfie camera I have ever worked with. It goes all the way up to 4K at 60 frames a second, and the clarity improvement over previous models is just out of this world. Lastly, let's talk about the battery. 
Now, you can find exact numbers about how long the battery on this phone will last under different conditions all over the net. I'm not going to repeat those here. All I will say is that in six weeks of daily use, I was never in a situation where the battery let me down. Now, keep in mind, I kept this phone running at full resolution and at 120 hertz. If you're willing to compromise on one of those two aspects, you will get longer lifetime out of it. One of the reasons it's not a particularly big deal to run the battery down is how quickly the phone can charge. Now, there are phones out there that can charge really quickly using 40 or 60 watt charging, but the S21 Ultra manages to reach a full battery in an hour from just about any percentage using only a 25 watt fast charger, which is sold separately, by the way. You don't get any charger at all in the box. Thanks, Apple. Now, the S20 did support charging at high wattages, but really, most people don't use those high wattage charges, and ultimately, it's not that great for the lifespan of your battery. While we're on the topic of charging, one of the coolest features of the S21 Ultra is retained from earlier models like the Note 10 or the S20, and that is you can wirelessly charge accessories on the back of the phone. So whether it's a pair of Galaxy Buds or a Samsung smartwatch, you can just activate wireless power share, flip the phone over, and then carefully place the device on the back of the phone to charge. It's that simple. So here are my final thoughts on the Galaxy S21 Ultra. I really do think it should be considered an ultimate phone. At the moment, this is probably the best all-rounder phone. Although it might not be the best at any single one thing, it is a general purpose beast. I think you can find phones out there that will do specific things like get higher megapixel counts or have slightly better game performance, but I can't imagine anybody buying the S21 Ultra and being unhappy with its general usage and performance. Most people probably don't need the S21 Ultra, and will be perfectly happy with a mid-range phone from Samsung or another manufacturer, but you will always give up something in exchange for that lower price point. In the end, it is definitely worth the money, but it might not be worth the money for you. To me, this feels like the most complete, no compromise device Samsung has ever made. And I really feel that in two years, I might not have the urge to upgrade quite as badly as I did this time. See you next time.